There is a home and a light that shines as we journey through this life. We find His peace inside from the one true God who came to die. Good morning and welcome to On the Road with Jesus. My name is Rody Fisher, and I'll be your host this morning. And thank you, Clint Gonzalez, for that wonderful lead-in song. Let's pray. Father, I do thank you and praise you for all that you do for us, in us, and through us. I pray that you would be with Sean and Guy in the booth, as well as <clears throat> Jeff, my special speaker, and myself. Be especially with our words and our thoughts, Lord, that you would put that together so that we could speak the truth in love exactly the way you would present it, Lord. Help us <clears throat> to do it right. Lord, um, we pray that you would give us understanding of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So welcome again, um, listeners. We are in Psalm 37. Um, for those of you that May, may not know this, or maybe that you do. It is kind of a long psalm. Um, again, it is a psalm of David, and um, I think I said it earlier that I love the psalms because it seems as though he's journaling or writing. You know, the Lord is using David to write his thoughts down, like kind of on not a daily basis, but this journey that he's writing. And so here he is <clears throat> um, having some trouble again, and he is writing Psalm 37. So let's just begin. Give us understanding, Lord. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the work, workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so that thou shalt dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desire of your heart. Boy, do I, do I really love that <clears throat> scripture a lot. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he'll give you the desire of your heart. <clears throat> Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him that he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth the righteousness as, as the light and thy judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass, who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Now that means don't do the evil stuff. Don't do the bad stuff. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait upon the Lord shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> For yet a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place and it shall not be but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace and the wicked plotteth against the just and gnasheth upon him with his teeth the lord shall laugh at him for he seeth that this day is coming the wicked have drawn out the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, <clears throat> and to slay such as be such as be of um, upright conversation. Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. A little that the righteous man hath is better than the riches of the many of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholdeth the righteous. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, 
and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time and in the days of famine. They shall be satisfied, but the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord shall be as of fat lambs. They shall, cons they sh they shall consume unto smoke. They consume away. <clears throat> I'm going to just go up to the 20th verse and we'll pick it up tomorrow um, or the next time I'm on because it's a long um, psalm. Thank you, Lord, for your word. <clears throat> I pray that this um, gets hidden in your heart here. <clears throat> it's time to, again, um, introduce my guest. Um, he was here um, for the first show. If you've missed it, please check it out. I think it's show number... 55, which was your testimony. Welcome, Dr. Jeff Cran. It's good to be with you again. Okay, super. Um, today we're going to be discussing, um, if you've missed his testimony, catch it. Um, it was the previous show. But today we're going to be talking about, <clears throat> as you probably know, Jeff's background <clears throat> is Jewish. And he studied... Um, and, and knew the Old Testament fairly well, um, had gone to um, um, was that a Hebrew school? Oh yeah. Okay, so he was studied at Hebrew school and also um, went to Hebrew camp. So he knew um, a little bit or quite a bit about the Old Testament. So today we're gonna be talking to him about the Trinity in the Old Testament. So we're going to hone in on a certain subject as it relates to the, to the Old Testament and see if we can uncover the many verses in there that show the Trinity of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, super. So where do you want to start? <clears throat> well, let me start by explaining, you know, why that presents a difficulty to a Jewish person. Okay. Uh, it might be good for you to understand that uh, to your Jewish friend, um, this is a this is a real issue, particularly to the Orthodox uh, Jewish friend. Maybe to a secular Jewish friend, who may be more atheistic or agnostic, like my father, the existence of God might be where you have to start, uh, because if you don't have a God, you don't have a Trinity. But to the Orthodox Jewish person who's very convinced that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob exists, this represents a real objection, a real barrier. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it might be good to know why it represents a barrier. Uh -huh. uh, there are two reasons. Uh, one is far older than the other, and that's the Shema. And for me, that was a, a major reason why the Trinity represented a barrier. Uh, you'll find that in your Bibles, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Right. Um, and what you'll probably see, depending on your translation, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, some translations are doing you a favor by trying to uh, help you a little bit. And you might see in parentheses or in italicized letter, one Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one Lord. Uh, there's a reason they're trying to do that that we'll, we'll end up delving into a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, but if you were to take it very woodenly in Hebrew, you wouldn't have the word Lord after the word one. So if you're being very wooden, if you're taking it like a word-by-word -word translation, uh, you would hear, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, Jewish people who are non-observant uh, have this verse uh, really ingrained. Mm -hmm. So that even a Jewish person who may not even be a believer that God exists uh, will be very uh, ingrained with this verse. Uh, my kids learned it in Hebrew from the cradle. We actually taught it to them. Uh, mm -hmm. For me, it was like a life verse, mm -hmm. uh, an oath of fealty to the king. And so uh, it's prayed three to four times a day. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, 9. Oh, all the way to 6, 9. All the way to 6, <clears throat> 9. Okay. Uh, the second part of this is called the Via Hafta. You shall love Via Hafta. Mm -hmm. So it's all one section of scripture. Uh, it's prayed. It's recited in Hebrew. Uh, the Orthodox person's going to recite that three to four times a day. Mm -hmm. um, 
it's part of the only bedtime prayer that's really exists in Judaism. Okay. Uh, and so a Jewish person's terribly familiar with that, and that's one of the barriers. Uh, but it isn't really a barrier when you understand the, the section, and we'll go through it. We'll talk about it a little. Uh, the second is what happened to Judaism. Uh, when you reach the Middle Ages, a gentleman named Moses Maimonides, who's known as the Rambam, uh, becomes a major thinker in Judaism. He's one of the first to systematize what Judaism believes. Mm -hmm. uh, Judaism didn't really have a statement of faith. That's uh -huh. kind of a foreign concept to Jewish people. If you say, well, what's your synagogue statement of faith? He just kind of looks at you with this blank stare because synagogues don't have statements of faith. Uh -huh. uh, but Moses Maimonides during this time period, uh, and it's right around the Crusades and that whole time period, wants to finally be able to define Judaism in relationship to uh, what was then Catholicism and Islam. Okay. So he creates what are called the 13 Articles of Faith. They also appear in the Jewish prayer book. He emphasizes God's oneness, even changing the word from Deuteronomy 6.4 in his formulation of God's oneness. So these two things work together to make your Jewish friend have this, this gut feeling that the Trinity has to be wrong. Mm -hmm. And for your Jewish friend, if you don't know who God is, it doesn't matter what else you believe. Because mm -hmm. if you're telling them the way of God and you don't know anything about God, why would I trust or you, you about anything? Or you don't care anything about God. Or you don't care mm -hmm. anything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so your Jewish friend is going to have a response. And, and I love the way my dad put it. The God I'm not sure exists is one and not three. <laughs> And that's just a real Jewish gut level response. Yeah. Um, so the first thing you have to end up dealing with is you're going to have to deal with um, the issue of the Shema. You're going to have to at some point uh, discuss that. Um, is, is the Trinity polytheism? And that's what you might hear from your Jewish friend. Well, you guys have this this weird form of substandard, not so good monotheism. It's sort of contaminated, and and that's what a, a Orthodox Jew might respond to is uh -huh. is you're leaving monotheism, <clears throat> right? Um, and so we have to understand kind of how to deal with that. The other thing is the term Trinity doesn't make sense to a Jewish person. Uh -huh. uh, most Christians don't understand the origin of the word Trinity. Mm -hmm. We use the term, but we don't know where it kind of came from. Mm -hmm. uh, it comes from the Latin that means three. Mm -hmm. So when you say Trinity to a Jewish person, he thinks you're talking about three gods because it's Latin for three. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't understand the connection between the threeness and the oneness. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what you need to do for your Jewish friend first is to be able to explain what you are getting at with the Trinity. What is what is the central concept that the Trinity conveys? What's the picture mm -hmm. that this doctrine conveys? And think about doctrines as pictures, and it might help you. Your Jewish friend needs a picture to translate this. Mm -hmm. So what I might say to a Jewish person is, the Trinity is not about whether God is one. It's about the nature of his oneness. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about how he's one. <clears throat> yeah. It's even hard for a Christian to explain it. I know that I've heard the egg version, which I kind of don't like, and I've heard the ice or the water version of trying to explain the Trinity, but it's three separate beings or personalities in one God, in one person, and that person is God. Is that kind of it? That's kind of it. We have a problem because if we're three people, we end up in a, in a rubber room. We can't be yeah. tri-personal. I see. Okay, I can see where that would... So I like to say uh, God <clears throat> is one. His oneness is cubed. Oh, yeah. You think of it geometrically. A cube is one shape. But if we say something squared, we say to the second power. Mm -hmm. So I like to say, well, well, people are persons, uh, but God is like super personal 
Uh-huh. Okay, he's like 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 cubed. He's in yes. three dimensions. I like that. Uh. I like that. I've I've had it explained to me that um, you know I'm a human being, but you wouldn't call me a human being. You'd call me Rhodey. You know, I'm just one of many humans. So you wouldn't call me, you know, like you're Jeff. Um, <clears throat> but there are three beings in one. But that still gets you into the, you know, the three persons. Right? Yeah, we don't have a good analogy. Mm -hmm. um, because this is a, a doctrine that is best understood by what it tells us. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh than understood by trying to come up with a picture for it. Okay. Um, and we'll discuss that. Okay. Uh, you know, for me, explaining why the Trinity is useful helps. Okay. What does this doctrine do? What, is it, what does it tell us about our God and the way the world is that wouldn't be the same if it wasn't true? Uh -huh. So sometimes I'll, I'll create alternate worlds. What would be true if this wasn't true? Mm -hmm. What would the world look like? Mm -hmm. And since it doesn't look like that, then I know it is true. Yeah, exactly. Um, for the Shema, yeah. we need to understand what it says and doesn't say. Okay. Uh, when you see a doctrine, we have to understand this. God never gives doctrine in isolation to the story. Hmm. OK, mm -hmm. so whenever you see a doctrine, you've got to put it back in the story because, see, our God's a relational God. He isn't just giving us bare facts. Mm -hmm. He's giving us facts in relationship to who he is and who we were created to be. Okay. So often we look at doctrine and we do systematic theology and it's got its place. But the problem is by doing this, we tend to isolate God's attributes into cute little boxes mm -hmm. and it, we tend to lose the story. Mm -hmm. So let me get to the context. Deuteronomy 6, 4 comes after Deuteronomy chapter 5. Now, you know, for those who went to Sunday school, you know that Deuteronomy 5 is the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. Deuteronomy 6 immediately follows. So if you're following the story, uh, what you see is you see the, the whole experience of Sinai and getting the Ten Commandments. It's being repeated again. Okay, because this mm -hmm. is the second repetition of the law. Right. <clears throat> the okay. first is in Exodus, in Exodus 20. Yeah. And it's real easy to remember how to find the Ten Commandments because it's in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5 and 5. It's half of 20. Oh, no. What's, what's it's a fourth. fourth of 20. But you're talking multiples of five. Yeah. Um, the point of this is, is God has just made a agreement with these people. Okay, there's a exclusive agreement. Okay, time. Think of it like husband and wife. There's a, a, a exclusive relationship here. We want to get along here, so we're, we'll put forth some rules. Maybe something like that. Something like that. Um, the key with why this is so important is the point of the Shema is not some sort of philosophical discussion of God's oneness. The point of the Shema is allegiance to him, to him. Mm -hmm. So when you put it back in the context, God isn't just giving you some sort of deep philosophical statement about what his oneness is like. He's giving you a statement about the Lord alone. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there's more than one translation of the Hebrew Bible that's Jewish that translates it that way. Okay. The Jewish Publication Society of the Bible, there's a uh, version that translated, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone, mm -hmm. in order to emphasize that idea. Of one God. Of, of allegiance. Okay. okay. Oh, just him alone, yes. I him alone. Mm -hmm. So when someone says, well, the Shema it forbids the Trinity, I say, well, the Shema isn't about God's nature. It's about allegiance to God. Mm -hmm. So you're already pulling this out of its context. Mm -hmm. You've removed it from the story, and so you don't understand what it's saying. It's like hearing part of a phone call, and you hear the other person say, yeah, right, sure. They could be talking about their grocery list or having the lawn mowed. You don't know. Mm -hmm. You have to have the context. Mm -hmm. 
The other thing is the uniqueness of the Hebrew language. I'm going to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. Okay. Okay? The word echad is one of two words that is translated one. There's yechad and yechid. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into Hebrew, but these words are slightly different in what they convey. Okay. Echad can be used for the number one. Okay, my whoops, my Hebrew professor Zakava was Dr. Glazer was very clear about that. Okay. But there's a difference in connotation. If you walk up to a pretty woman, you say, That's a wonderful perfume you have, that's great. If you walked up to a woman and said, Hey, that's a wonderful stench you're wearing today, I don't think she'd have the same reaction. Mm -mm. So we have something called connotation. Now Yechid connotates one or only in terms of being only one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's used of uh, Isaac, take thy son, thy Yechid ben, thy only son. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you want to emphasize that something is uniquely alone or one only, you would be likely, you would use Yechid most mm -hmm. likely. That would be the way to emphasize the oneness, the, the oneness, the exclusiveness. Only him. Only him. If you want to say that something's one, but you want to leave the door open to a wider understanding of that one or a more uh, compound one or anything like that, you'd use echad. Now, how do I know that? Because it says that, that uh, uh, the husband and wife will become one flesh. Genesis 2, 24. Mm -hmm. uh, a man shall leave his household and a woman leave her home and the two shall become one flesh. Echad betzer. Oh, yeah, that's a great example. Okay. Now, what God isn't telling me is that I am sharing the same body and personality with my wife. Mm -hmm. Okay. We become a unit. The other place this is used is in numbers. Um, and I could probably give you the location of that. Uh, but it's used when they come back from the land and they bring a cluster of grapes. Oh, yeah. Um. Um, where they go and spy out they the spy land, out the land and uh, Caleb and um, Joshua right come and they back bring back a, a a cluster, cluster of, of grapes. grapes a huge cluster a huge cluster of grapes and and the Hebrew is very clear it's a chad es skull uh -huh. one cluster now I always try to imagine what it'd be like if these guys said hey the land's really fruitful and they brought one little grape tied to the pole yeah I mean, that would really make the point, wouldn't it? Right. Just That's all you could find was one puny grape and you tied it to a pole and you want us to go into this land? Yeah. The idea is that you needed a word that would mean one but didn't have to exclusively mean one only. Mm -hmm. Hebrew provides that. Wow. When the Shema is used, it's echad, not yechid. In fact, God never refers to himself in terms of being an absolute yechid. Okay? Never. Not as far as his nature. Mm -hmm. Okay? If he wants to refer to allegiance, there are a few places. Mm -hmm. I am God alone. Mm -hmm. But the point is, when he's talking about his nature, he doesn't use yechid. Which means he doesn't want to emphasize the absolute oneness because that's not what he's trying to get across. Mm -hmm. Now, what Moses Maimonides did is he switched the words. Okay. He said, I believe with perfect faith that God is one, but he switched echad for yechid. And which, which version of the Bible do most Orthodox Jews use then? If you're talking most Orthodox Jews, they'll accept what's called the stone edition. Mm -hmm. which I don't have in my library, and probably will take care of that. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of what were called the JPS. The mm -hmm. JPS was the Jewish Publication Society. There's a 1917 uh, that's mm -hmm. included in the Logos Library, and mm -hmm. then there's some other editions. Uh, the stone is the one that you won't get an Orthodox Jewish person, at least not when I was doing the streets in New York sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, to argue with. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
you know, what I'm pointing out here is that both the context and the word choose do not demand an absolute unitarian view of God. Mm-hmm. Okay, unitarian view is God is one God and one person. Mm-hmm. So we say that, you know, that's a unitarian view of God. Mm-hmm. And so God's pretty clear about not picking a word that forces that view. I love it. Um, so that's one thing to consider. The other is to consider the way God plays with grammar. Mm-hmm. If I see something in a language where the grammar laws have to be violated temporarily to convey spiritual truth, that makes my ears come up. Mm-hmm. I like to say my, my theological spidey sense tingles. Mm-hmm. Okay. Everybody likes to go to the beginning uh, and God created man in his image. Yes. I've heard that many okay. times. And they'll point out that Elohim is plural. Mm-hmm. So if you're turning your Bible there, you're talking about Genesis 127. Mm-hmm. Okay. And what your Jewish person may do is one of two things. Now, remember, I'm an apologist, so I'm thinking about where their objections are going to be and how I can address those objections. Yeah. So the apologist part of me wants to know, okay, where are their stumbling blocks mentally going to be? What information have they been fed that doesn't accurately convey that might get in the way? Mm -hmm. So a a Christian will say, well, well, Elohim is plural. Mm -hmm. God said, let us make man in our image. Mm Mm-hmm. And your Jewish person is going to probably give two responses. Uh, one is the plural of majesty. Now, this is the one that Muslims use a lot. Mm-hmm. They borrow Jewish objections, and they're borrowing more and more of them. That's why I've enjoyed working with George. Is there's this beautiful thing called crossover apologetics, yeah. where two groups of people are using the same objections. Get, and you can use the same you can use the, the same, same thing. thing. You can yeah. mm-hmm. you can deal with the intersection. Yeah. So one answer is going to get the plural of majesty. Now, if you don't know what that is, the Queen of England helped us out with that. Uh, Queen Victoria used to say, we are not amused. Mm-hmm. Okay. And she was using what's called the majestic plural. She's so queenly that it's as if there was more than just her. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. We call that the majestic plural. The other one is someone's going to borrow from Rashi, who claimed that God was speaking to the angels. Mm-hmm. I've so, heard that, too. Okay, that's a pretty common one. Rashi made that popular in the Middle Ages. Mm-hmm. He was another great thinker, and so he influenced things. Um, and so that's what you're going to get. Now, there's a way to deal with that argument on several grounds. Um, okay. First of all, In any language, and this is true in Hebrew, you have to have your pronouns and your nouns line up. They have to agree in gender and number. Mm -hmm. Okay? Because that's the way languages are supposed to operate. They're Mm -hmm. supposed to be that way. When you start with God created, Mm -hmm. okay, uh, you have a third person singular noun. Let's call that he, okay? Okay. If I say third person singular, male, it's he. Mm -hmm. Okay? Now, here's the thing. You have a third person singular verb Mm -hmm. with a plural noun. Yeah. Well, grammatically, you don't do that. Okay? You would then make the noun singular. Mm -hmm. Okay? You don't say, Jeff, are going to the store. No. You say, Jeff, is going to the store. Mm -hmm. The verb takes the same number. You have a verb that's one way. You have the subject of that verb being plural. And then when it says, let us make man in our image, Mm -hmm. okay, or he made man in his image, God made man in his image, you're back to a third person singular. Mm Mm-hmm. So your verbs are singular, but the object of the verbs is plural. Mm-hmm. Now, why does God do that? That's a violation of grammatical rules mm-hmm. because he wants to convey a mystery. 
and so he deliberately violates the rules of Hebrew to hint at a mystery. And what you'll get from Jewish people is, well, every time Elohim is used, the verb is singular. Yeah, that's the point. The verb shouldn't be singular if the noun's plural. Mm -hmm. Why does the verb not match the noun? Because there, he wants you to know that there's a pluralness in him. That's right. There's a plurality in him. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah. And so that argument doesn't work against it. It works for it. Mm -hmm. Because God's created a chromatical problem by pluralizing. And even if you say the plural of majesty, again, the verb needs to be singular. Mm -hmm. So how do we recognize a plural of majesty? Because the verbs still remain. Mm -hmm. They match. They do. If you do a plural of majesty, you have a plural verb. You don't have a singular verb. Okay. And so you have a grammatical sort of uh, in imbalance here. Mm -hmm. um, so that doesn't disprove the Trinity. To me, it, it, it almost proves it because mm -hmm. God's violating grammatical laws to tell me something's different. Mm -hmm. um, the other are the theophanies. Okay. Um, God's made appearances before. We'll talk about this more later, but, but the appearances of God are God. Mm -hmm. But if God's appearances are God, then we have a hint of something going on. Uh, the angel of the Lord is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, the angel of the Lord's deity in Exodus 3. Um, and I can't really read the whole verse because it's, it's a lengthy passage here. But 1 through 6, what I want you to see is the switching between the angel of the Lord and God. So when you're reading this section and you're looking down, you're going to see that Moses was hanging out in the desert with his flock mm -hmm. near the mountain of the Lord, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire. Right. Okay? And you're thinking, okay, this is some angel, right? Mm -hmm. um, the Lord sees that he had turned. Well, wait a minute. I thought it was the angel of the Lord. Well, the Lord sees he's turned. Well, now who's seeing he's turned? The angel of the Lord or the Lord? Mm -hmm. Then God called to him from the midst of the fire. Well, wait a minute. Did the angel of the Lord call God mm -hmm. from the midst of the fire? Mm -hmm. um, and so now you have to start asking yourself, well, what's going on here? Uh, if I say that the angel of the Lord is God, does God cease to exist? Is there God and the angel of the Lord? Well, you know, you've got this sort of switching. Dichotomy. You have a bit of a dichotomy there. Yeah. Um, there are ways that this is dealt with, but my point is that, um, you know, there's, there's dichotomy here where the angel of the Lord is acknowledged as God. God's acknowledged as God. Uh, then you have cases where the angel of the Lord and God ex appear at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, the verse is in Chronicles. Uh, but the angel of the Lord and God have a discussion over the judgment of Jerusalem under David. Mm -hmm. Well, who's talking to who? The angel of the Lord is God. And God is God. And they're having a conversation where God tells the angel of the Lord to relent from destroying Jerusalem. Uh -huh. Interesting. So that gets interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so we're seeing the plurality, plural, pluralness of God. What is the word? Yeah, you're seeing a plurality, plurality. that is deity. Okay. God is being talked about in more than one way, and sometimes those two ways that God is manifest are communicating with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay? And so now, if God's communicating with God, and the two of them seem to be acting as persons together, I have two persons, mm -hmm. or I have two gods. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, the angel of the Lord is having a conversation with God. Well, persons converse with each other. So now we have two persons conversing that are both deity. Uh -huh. um, there are places where this is even clearer. Um, one of my favorites is uh, Jews will refer to the Orthodox, will refer to the glory of God as the Shekinah, Shekinah. Yeah. This is a key way that God dealt with Israel. He, he visits them in the person of the angel Lord. He visits them in the glory of the Lord. And he visits them as the word. We're going to talk about the word because this is where John gets the word. Uh -huh. But I'm going to go to the, the glory of the Lord. Okay, now the glory of the Lord was this, this dwelling presence of God. In fact, the word Shekinah comes from Shechen, which means to dwell. So they started referring to God coming in the cloud and in the flame of fire and dwelling between the cherubim as as the dwelling because God was literally residing there okay uh -huh. now a weird thing happens in Exodus 16 okay okay what what uh, I'm getting there um, should be right around here uh, the issue is the manna, and people are getting tired of manna. Uh -huh. And so the children of Israel basically complain. Verse 4. Uh, looking right there. No, you got to go down a little further. Here we Glory go. Glory of the Lord, 7. Yeah, I'm looking right there. Here's what you got. So Aaron and Moses, they were, they were wise uh -huh. and humble. They take the issue to God. Uh-huh. And Moses ends up saying to the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of the land of Egypt. That's clearly the Lord. Uh -huh. In the morning you will see the glory of the Lord. For he, he who? He, the glory of the Lord, has heard your complaints against who? The Lord. Huh. Wait a minute now. Yeah. The glory of the Lord is God. We know that from Exodus 40. We know that he said he would dwell between the cherubim, and the glory of the Lord dwelt between the cherubim, so it's deity. They fall down and worship when God's glory fills the temp uh, the tabernacle. Uh -huh. you, don't, you don't worship men. You don't worship angels. You worship God. Uh -huh. They worship, and then here we see that in the morning, the glory of the Lord hears your complaints against the Lord. Interesting, yeah. So only persons hear. Electricity doesn't hear anything. Exactly. Okay. And so now we have this mysterious glory of the Lord that's deity. Uh -huh. We have the Lord that's deity. And both of them are distinct from each other. Uh -huh. So we have distinction, we have deity, and we have personhood. Those are the three ingredients of the Trinity. Uh -huh. Right there. Yeah. So that's a place where we see this sort of unique conversation that goes on mm -hmm. um, between uh, God and his glory. Let's talk about the other one. It's called the Memra. When you opened John, I used to think John was the most un-Jewish gospel. Remember, I, I shared my testimony. I went through Matthew. And I, I got exposed to John before I got saved. I, what is this piece of writing? Uh, and then I started to learn where John got his terminology from. The word memra, which is translated word, is from the word emar. Jewish people had this issue right around Jesus' day. And we'll, you know, talk about the, the Trinity is so important. Um, how does a transcendent God enter into his creation? If he's out here, he's not in here. Right. How do we deal with that? And so they used to have these conversations about how God could enter his creation. And this happened around Jesus' time. And they got the idea that God enters the world through his word. Uh -huh. It's called the Memra. And so right around Jesus' day, uh, there was this idea that started to form. Uh, they thought of the word from Aramaic, uh, as the way God sort of entered into his world. But the, the memory gets personified uh -huh. 
And so if you watch the old Batman show, okay, you know, the biff and the boof would appear in these little bubbles. Mm -hmm. And so they sort of pictured it that way. But it turns out the word of God began to get regarded as deity. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Targums were Aramaic translations that were read in the synagogue around Jesus' day. So you'd have the Hebrew reading and then you'd have the Aramaic reading. And it started with Ezra and Nehemiah. Let me show you what happens here. This is uh, Genesis 1, 27, right? Mm-hmm. God created man. Mm-hmm. Now that's the Hebrew. But watch what happens when the Aramaic is read. When it was translated into Aramaic, the word of the Lord created man. Oh. So you'd, you'd hear the Hebrew and then you'd hear the Aramaic. Mm-hmm. Uh, Genesis 6, 6, and 7, it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, right? Uh But what did the Aramaic paraphrase say? It repented the Lord through his word that he had made man on the earth. Oh, interesting. In the beginning was the Memra, and the Memra was God. Uh Uh-huh. He, the Memra, was with God in the beginning. And so John is borrowing from the Greek Logos, but he's also borrowing from the Aramaic concept of Memra. Uh Okay? And so what John's doing is, this is really Jewish, he's, he's taking a concept that was common in Jewish and Aramaic thought in order to convey the unique place of uh the second person in the Trinity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's as though you have uh, the Father, you have the Word, and you have the Spirit. Who became flesh. Who became flesh and dwelt among us. Yes. See, yeah. this is what John is doing. Mm-hmm. And to a first century Jewish audience, this isn't such a strange idea. Right. Um and so that's where you start seeing these pluralities in these interconversations, in these concepts where where the word is literally personified. Uh, the verse that says uh, in Psalms, God sent forth his word and he healed them. Mm-hmm. How did he heal them? Through his word. And so you start to see this sort of thing develop. Yeah. Um, and so these are places where this ends up coming up. Now, there are places where where a Jewish person might want to argue against this, particularly a rabbi. Mm-hmm. Your Jewish friend isn't going to answer you right away. What he might do is say, I'm going to go check with my rabbi. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of like a Catholic person saying, I'm going to check with my priest. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where the rabbi might give him some uh, counters Um, and I'm just kind of pulling up some notes here, uh, some of the counters and how to deal with them. Because see, an apologist has to guide truth around other people's roadblocks. So you have to say, okay, so now my friend goes to the rabbi and he's got a whole new set of roadblocks. Okay. Um, there are other places than the Shema, uh, now see that I am he, there is no God besides me. I kill and make alive, I wound and I heal, nor can anyone deliver from my hand, Deuteronomy thirty-two thirty-nine. 39. Mm-hmm. So your Jewish friend goes to his rabbi and he says, look, he says, boy chick, that's kind of, you know, sunny. Mm-hmm. Uh, your Christian friends are misreading our Bible. You know, they just misinterpret because they don't, they don't know any better. They just misinterpret our scriptures. So let me give you a verse for your Christian friend. Go back, tell them to turn to Deuteronomy 32, 39. And, and the argument's over. Well, that's not true. Um, you're, you're making a mistake. Uh, a lot of people don't know what a contradiction is. For something to be a contradiction... It's got to be saying two opposite things the same way at the same time. I went to the store and I got milk and then I went back to my hotel and I slept. Well, Jeff, you're contradicting yourself. No, I'm not. I didn't say I went to get milk while I was sleeping. That would be a contradiction. Mm -hmm. 
So there's kind of a false analogy here. Um, the context of Deuteronomy, and always start with your context. Go back and plug it into the story. Uh -huh. Because what is God saying to these people at this time in history? What is he conveying to them? Uh -huh. Tells us what he's conveying. The issue is the exclusivity of God. Every time you find a verse that speaks of God being one, it's always in terms of allegiance. Uh -huh. um, and so what we're finding out is God's unique. Uh -huh. uh, 32, 1 through 5, uh, ascribe greatness to our God. Uh -huh. He is the rock. His work is perfect. His ways are just. A God of truth without injustice. Righteous and upright is he. Now the rabbi is saying, because it says that God uh, says that he is unique as God, different than the rest of his creation, that invalidates the Trinity. Uh -huh. But God isn't talking about that. God's talking about his uniqueness in terms of the other rest of the created order. He is distinct from the rest of the creator, the creation. He is great. He is the rock. Uh -huh. He is perfect. His ways are just. As opposed to the rest of creation that gets its goodness from God, he is the source of all those things. Uh -huh. So it isn't about his oneness. Um, could God be good and still be threefold? Well, yes, he could. Uh -huh. He could be good and be threefold. Goodness doesn't require him not to be threefold. Does this verse indicate that God is only one in his essence, in his nature? That's the thing you got to ask your Jewish friend. Does your Torah say God's only one in his nature? Or does it say he's exclusively to be worshipped? Uh -huh. Exclusive to be worshipped. It's worshipped, which means it doesn't violate anything for him to be triune. Uh -huh. um, That's really good. Uh, and that's what you're going to find with a lot of these verses. They're really pulled out of context. Uh, the other is that people will pull idolatry out. Uh -huh. Christians are guilty of idolatry. Now, more than one God. Yeah. Um, that term is used more widely. Well, is it also brought up because in some churches there's idols in there? Jewish people are very sensitive to images of God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you go back to the Second Temple synagogues, you will see no art or pictures mm -hmm. because of that. Uh, there was a big argument in Judaism in the Middle Ages whether art was allowed mm -hmm. um, in terms of faces. Now, this is true of the Muslim, too. You'll see right. all the decoration on a Muslim mosque is all Arabic letters decoratively formed because the Muslim is as sensitive to this as the Jew is. Mm -hmm. um, I understand uh, the desire to portray the humanity of Jesus. And that's what a lot of people are doing. I do have to say, though, medieval art really kind of caught me funny. Yeah, me too. Because Jesus was walking around with a halo around his head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this glowing thing. Yeah. And I figured, you know, if I was like looking for the Messiah and this guy like glowed in the dark, he'd be like the first person I'd start hanging around. Right. So they always struck me pretty humorous, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. How, you know, how could you have your own electronic luminescent light? <laughs> no one would notice. Yeah, right. Um, but that's that's where some of that sensitivity comes from. Um, um, so we've got about um, I'm going to say six minutes to kind of wrap this up as having the Trinity of God in the Bible. Um, you've given us several verses, but um, and, and I like them. So I, I know this is a big subject, and you're looking at me like not even halfway through. It's okay. So let me end with why the Trinity is important. Mm -hmm. Why do we need this doctrine? Because mm -hmm. doctrines serve purpose. Uh, we believe that God in his essence is love. Now, this, this works really nicely with a Muslim. If, if John or the scriptures indicate that God is love in his essence, uh -huh. he possesses that as an attribute, 
Whom did God love before the creation of the world? Because love has to have an object. You can't love nothing and love. So one of the things the Trinity does is it explains how God's essence could work within himself prior to creation so that he needed nothing else. Yeah. Uh, it also explains our desire for community. I've also used it to explain why marriage is set up the way it is. Mm -hmm. So uh, the way we function is a reflection of God having uh, community in himself and having diversity and unity in himself. Mm. Yeah, I see that. That's really good. So, even before he even created a, the, the world, that's really good. Okay, so um, um, we we've seen that there is more than one person in the in the um, in the Old Testament, but I have always heard, and maybe you can answer this for me, that when you read the Shema, there's they're really talking about three different they're they're mentioning God three times and I I've heard that um, that just in the mere fact of them mentioning God three times shows the plurality of God um, so here O Israel the Lord so that's one our God our God that's another one is one Lord so it it shows that it, it could be the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is one right in there. Um, there's a place in, in Isaiah that's messianic that might be better. What you have to be aware of is F emphasis. When God speaks to Abraham and he's about to sacrifice Isaac, he says, Abraham, Abraham. Does that mean that Abraham's a duality? Because his name is mentioned twice. Yeah, that's true. Hebrew uses repetition for emphasis. Yeah. So your Jewish friend who knows Hebrew is going to say, you know, that's that's pretty lame. Mm -hmm. You know, again, you're misinterpreting my scriptures because any Hebrew reader knows that repetition can mean emphasis, not necessarily multiple persons. Okay. So, but I but I do know that there's when they're saying the Shema. Don't they also blow the trumpet? Is there a trumpet blowing during that at all? The shofar is usually only blown. Now, some Messianic congregations do that. Oh, okay. Okay, and, and that's fine. I okay. mean, the word there is here. It's a command, here. Mm -hmm. It's not just here. It's here. Mm -hmm. I mean, listen up. Um, and And they're doing that you know, as an expression of their worship. But traditionally, when the Shema is recited, the shofar is, is not blown. Okay. There are other things that are done. Mm -hmm. um, you're supposed to block everything else, on, focus on the words, those sorts of things. But Okay, then going back to the plurality of God, where it says, in the beginning, Elohim. Um I used to always use that when I first learned about it in the 70s or the 80s when um, that, that, that showed the plurality of God. But the schooled Jewish person would say that that's, as you say, you know, Queen Elizabeth, we're talking about um, the bigness of the position. Right. Is that the answer that they would give us? Or they'll default to the angels if they're they're big Rashi fans. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, here's an experiment. The next time you want to make a point, turn it into a question and ask the person the question that makes the point. So what you might say is, I'm really curious here. Uh, the word Elohim is plural, but the verb is singular why is there a violation of Hebrew grammar here? And then let them wrestle with the answer for that. Okay. Okay. Wow, this, 
hour went by really fast. Um, I want to thank you for pointing those things out. I've got it all marked in my Bible now. Um, I hope I can remember it the way you told it so that um, if this comes up for me, I'll be able to rattle it, rattle it off as well as you did. Thank you so much for coming again, and I really appreciate the effort that you made in even coming. Um, and we'll be seeing you shortly. But I do want to talk to those that have listened in today, and especially to the person um, that has never made a commitment to Jesus, who we worship as our Lord and Savior, the three in one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one person. Jesus went to the cross for our sins, and I'm sure that you've heard that and thought, what does that mean? Well, he was the perfect lamb that shed his blood on the cross for you and for Jeff and everyone here and for you out there. So if you would like to accept Jesus as your Savior today, I would encourage you to follow me in a simple prayer and mean it with your whole heart. And you will be able to follow Jesus like we have. Or you can talk to him in your own way, knowing that he was the Lamb of God who shed his blood for you and me. Dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Help me to turn. I want to apologize for everything that I've said, done, or thought in the past, in the present, and even my future sins. I want to turn away from my previous sins and help you help me to not do those ever again. I want to repent of those things. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for being my Lord and Savior. Thank you for shedding that blood for me. Help me to walk with you and follow you for the rest of my days. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I also want to thank my special guest, um, Jeff, Dr. Jeff Cran, for being here, and um, we'll be seeing him again shortly for another subject in the Old Testament. And I want to thank you listeners for, for joining us today. Again, my name is Rhody Fisher, and if you have said that prayer and are giving your heart to the Lord today and would like to tell somebody, do call us here at the station at Hope Radio here in Corona, California, or email me on On the Road with Jesus. Thank you again for coming. We'll be seeing you again shortly every Tuesday and Wednesday here at Hope Radio from 11 o'clock to 12. God bless you all, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye now. Oh,